Hi, everybody. Uh, today we have Zhao Poyuan on the channel here. So thank you, Poyuan, for your time. Uh, today we are in this lovely, nice apartment here in Dubai as well. Uh, Poyuan runs an email marketing agency. It's called uh, Katora, right? Yes. Katora. Um, and today he's going to share with us some of the tips and tricks, tricks uh, stuff that seven, eight figure e commerce people will do. Also, yeah, share with him some of the tips on how to optimize email campaigns and stuff. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. Okay. I guess first, could you introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, tell, tell them who you are, what you stand for, what the company you built, and uh, who do you serve? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. So, uh, my name is Boyan, and I run an email agency called Plethora. We primarily work with like brands uh, between like the 1 million to 15 million a year uh, annual revenue type of range. And uh, yeah, I've been doing it for like four years. Um, dropped out of uni to do this, so it was a good decision looking at hindsight, despite the disapproval from family members, but, you know, it's a good vibe. And now we're in Dubai. Okay, so explain to us how you went from the UK, mm -hmm. and then you dropped, dropped out, and then your parents, I dropped out. And <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's, that's actually an interesting story, because um, how it, how it went was, I realized I really didn't want to go to uni because I was like, this is not going to create my dream life. Cause... Sorry, this after A levels? Uh, no, no, I actually did one first year of university. Okay. I finished it, um, I was actually doing computer science with AI. So, <laughs> okay. I, I think Pat... He's, he's doing data science, but... So, okay, so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so how I basically went was, I realized it, was, it wasn't going to give me my dream life because the way I value, evaluated risks back then was because of the whole computer science thing, I understood like mass, probability, all of this stuff. So I was like, okay, if I look at life as like a decision tree, yeah. I, would, I modeled it literally as a decision tree. That's how nerdy I was, right? The branches of me going down traditional uni would not get me to my dream life anyways, which was to be like, like offensively rich. Okay, basically. <laughs> that was that was long story short what it was, because I grew up like no right? So I just wanted to not be poor. Anyways, um I realized that there was no chance of me hitting that dream life by going down this path or like having uni be useful to me in the future. So I just decided to drop out. And I, I knew like all of the probabilities back then about oh, you know, like 80% of businesses fail um, and all of this stuff. But now I understand that 80% is just like people not really trying and doing, taking the right actions. Um, so anyways, I made the decision. I tanked my grades on purpose because I, I didn't have the balls to drop out. So you tanked it in uni? Yes, yeah. So I started my second year and I, I just didn't study. And back then I was like meditating and shit. I was like, I wonder if I just like don't study how bad uh, can I still pass, right? So I went from like 86 uh, something percent average, yeah. and then I just did a study for a whole semester and I went down to like uh, 65 for like after like two, three months. Which is not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> it's, not bad. So it's not possible, but I was like, well, fucked it up, so uh, time to drop out. So I, I dropped out because the, the university admin won't let me defer one year. Because they're bastards, they just want money, right? Okay. So they wouldn't let me defer one year. And I was like, with my admissions officer, I was like, basically just like, well, I'm going to go off and do this business thing. I need to defer one year. What are my options? And she was like, oh, well, we can't defer you. It's too late in the semester, too late in the year. Um, I was like, so my only option is to drop out. And she was like, yeah. I was like, great, easy. So I'm do 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 do, and then next day I was like, hi mom, um, uh, I dropped out. Oh shit, okay. And and the crazy part is, it was a WeChat video call. Both my mom and dad was present. <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. So so their reaction was like, like you can see that face going, like like. But then my mom was like, you know, boy, I'm. I had a dream about this, so you dropped out. So, we know you're not going to fuck your life up, but <laughs> it's in your own hands now. Which I, I'm super grateful for, because like, if they didn't support me, it would have been so much harder. You know? I'm not saying we're kind of scared, but like... Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, but um, you were you a bit grew up in London, right? Yeah. Okay. So like, what made you feel that way? Like, uh, you, people have uh, their their personality is based on inputs. Right? Yeah. They, they they're getting information from somewhere. So yeah. like, what what made you feel that way? Like about, about I want a dream life. This is oh. not the right right path for me. Yeah. There's so many stories of like instances where it demonstrated that we were poor in as a kid. Because like um so. I was born in China for the first six years of my life, and then we came to the UK because uh, my dad wanted to basically just move the family abroad because it's better to be poor in a rich country than be poor in a poor country, you know? Okay. I mean, China's not poor, but like, China's not poor. <laughs> we, we, we don't come from like Beijing, Shanghai, like the okay. one cities, you know? Because there's a big class like divide in China, and the social mobility isn't as good, yeah. right? So, sorry, which province is it from? Uh, Hunan. Okay. Hunan, so, no, there's a city called Zhengzhou, but I wasn't born in Zhengzhou, I was born in this town called Anyang. So imagine Zhengzhou is like the tier, the biggest city in the province, which was a tier 3 city, yeah. and then Anyang is the town. Yeah. That was like <laughs> manufacturing steel. Okay. Um, but yeah, anyway, so came to the UK, and then there was just so many instances growing up, you know, like... Mm, one time I had to get some like dental work done and my mom didn't know that uh, healthcare was free in the UK, right? Because it's in China, we just came here, right? We didn't know it was free for kids. Yeah. So I had this like big tunnel, so that was caused by one of my teeth that needed to be pulled out. And she was like, no, no, it's fine, like, it'll go away. <laughs> it's yeah, 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 like, it'll go away, don't worry about it, I'll give it two weeks, okay. three weeks, I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. It was just fucked, right? So finally, they scrounged up all the money they had, which was about two thousand pounds, and this was like borrowed money from like back home and shit. And they were like, "Okay, fine. We're like, we need to fix our son. Take, take me to the dentist after like three weeks of raw suffering, right?" Yeah. We go to the dentist. Um, I pull up, and the the, the white doctor was like. Ah, my mom was like, how much is this procedure going to be like, thinking like, this is in our pockets, you know, it's one of us who does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the doctor was like, oh, don't worry, you know, like, madam, please uh, have a seat, and duh, duh, like, boy, I'm come, come this way, we're going to, we're going to help you out, blah, blah, right? Throughout the whole time. Is it being picked up? Anyways, so the whole time, uh, her, her feel like mm-hmm. tapping, like sweating, anxious, blah blah. blah. And just... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. And long story short, doctor comes out, and I knew my family situation, financial situation as well. So I was asking, and then the doctor after the operation gives me a lollipop. I was like, no, thank you, thinking <laughs> he was gonna charge me for it, you know, like. Okay. <laughs> and then I was like, no thanks. And we were both like, give us the receipt now. I want to see it, right? What's the damage? You get me? So, anyways, uh, the doctor was like, no, don't worry, don't worry, you can leave. And throughout the whole process, every time the doctor deferred saying the price, my mom was like, oh, they're white, they're trying to sue us. <laughs> they're trying to sue, they're, gonna, they're trying to fuck with the immigrants, you know, trying to rip us off. And then it was finally, it was like, no, you're free to go. It's no cost, no money. And like the whole way, my mouth was like swollen, kind of bleeding, but numb, you know, like from the teeth being pulled out. Whole way, me and my mom was so happy. Like, so, so growing up, like everyone wants to have like nice professions. I just want to be rich. That's why. Yeah. Okay. So basically, that's why you love the UK. <laughs> I love the UK. I know that bleeding memories is just like, yeah, hey, man, I love the UK. I just saw it too, yeah. Yeah, I think the UK used to be very well run. Uh, still, I think it's like a really well run country to an extent now. I just think like uh, uh, it's kind of on the decline, which is kind of sad. But you know, I still love the UK, love London, it's still my favorite city. Okay, so um, finished secondary school, A levels, etc. Then you enrolled to uni. Yeah, like again, computer science is, is difficult, right? Would you? Is it difficult in the UK? Yeah, it, it's difficult, but yeah, okay. you know, like Asian study background. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So your your grades are small, right? Huh? And yeah, your grades? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, if, what's that called? Computer science, like you knew the path, like, tech careers. Mm. That's pretty solid. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so here's the story <laughs> about, <laughs> especially in the UK, like uh, Palantir, Apple, Microsoft has better standards there, right? So it's like it's not bad. But UK salaries don't compare to US. That's the thing. UK salaries, it's like UK salaries. Oh. If you if you're making a hundred k a year, ooh, you're balling. But then hundred k income after income tax is like sixty. Sixty. That's five thousand pounds take home per month. It's not a lot, right? It's like a good money, but as in like if you if you're trying to be multi multi millions, like it's it's not like after tax station. Exactly. So. Um, how I got turned off from tech though was actually, I did a weekend project thing at Facebook on one of the like VR things. Um, and then like, I was there in the London HQ and two software engineers walked into the elevator with me. Intention? No, it was, it was just a pro- research project kind of thing. And me being like, oh, this is a company that I want to work at in the future because they have free food and bean bags. Like, oh my God, this is sick. Um, I was like eavesdropping on the conversation, right? And I heard like the most like mundane conversation. I was like, yo, I, this can't be me in 10 years time. <laughs> it, it can't, it's not me, right? Okay. So, so that was when I decided, yeah, it's, I, I can't do computer science. Okay. Yeah. okay. So when, how did you encounter the online business stuff? Uh, I did like a door to door. Actually, you know what? You know what it was? Um, I, I saw one of Iman's ads. And I was like, fuck it. Oh, so probably very aggressive running 2017, so 2018. No, 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 this was uh, December 2019. 2019, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, so, so, oh no, sorry. Uh, I think maybe November, December, I don't know. But I dropped out and then I decided this is a business I want to do, agency. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so w- what did you do that Like, did it look like service? I did Facebook ads for e com. And okay. you know, the brand owners watching this, it's like there's not many good ad buying agencies, you know? Because ad buying itself, I like the, the longer time Yeah, like in 2020, yes, media buying was a skill. And now I I feel like media buying is less of a skill. It's more like how do you analyze the data? How do you like how do you measure it, right? And then also um do you understand the unit economics of the business? And then ultimately a good ad buyer now needs to understand creative really well and audience as well. Like matching the right creative with the right audience, right? Because that's, otherwise like CBOs will take care of the rest. You just need to just make sure your ad creatives are like innovating all of this stuff, right? So ad buying itself became over time the one year I was doing it, I just kind of realized there was not a huge amount of future in this because um, if I had an e com brand, I would have hired an ads agents. You know, I would get a media buyer to in house and then be like the creative director in the beginning and bring in a creative director later on, mm-hmm. right? So, anyways, um, ran that for about 10 months. Uh, 12 months, sorry. And then during that 10 months, there was a couple of our clients that didn't do any emails. So one of the brands that we actually uh, like grew to exit, basically, uh, they, they were like a big Amazon brand, wanted Shopify presence uh, so that they can sell for a higher multiple because, you know, multi-channel, blah, blah. Um, so we basically got charge of their Shopify channels completely. So we did all of the growth, all of the Facebook ads. We did some entry level CRO stuff on that as well. And um, at one point we were just, because it was supplement brands, so supplement brand generally, you know, the AOB is not crazy high. Um, and then you just need retention, right? Because supplements, the CAC in that space is just wild. So we couldn't get uh, to above break even on the front end with ads. No, sorry. we. we we were running on maybe like two, three percent margins on front end, right? Which is okay, it's technically break even. Yes, it's break even, but it's still like not good. You know what I mean? So I was like, oh, this brand doesn't do any email marketing. I told the owner, I was like, listen, bro, like, can we run your emails potentially? And he was like, oh yeah, no one's doing it now. So after implementing emails, we were able to actually scale the ads even more and that's how we were able to like 4x the brand in um i think eight months or something and then from the 
six, eight months later, they they were like prepping the uh, brand for exit. And I don't know exactly how much they sold for, but it was somewhere between that 15, 20 range, you know? Mm -hmm. So through that experience, I was like, oh, this email client was zero headache, very easy to run, very linear as a service. There's, because with emails, it's basically like retargeting. So you're not as heavily reliant upon the client delivering you like creatives because it's not video based because it's all image based. And even if it's gifts, we can produce everything ourselves. So emails was a channel that we can be in complete control. Of, whereas with meta ads or any type of like paid social, there's just so many moving parts, right? Cogs change. Uh, like during 2020, 2021, freight prices were like yep. through the fucking roof, yep. right? So your shipping prices affected your cogs because your landing goes up. Um, but variety of factors. Anyway, it's long story short, stuck with emails. Okay. Killed off the ads. So basically, light bulb moment for you. Oh man, no, <laughs> no frustration from this client. Very, it's yeah, very yeah, bad. that's very easy. Yeah. And it was not even that, bro. Like, I was looking at the education around emails back then. It was only Chase Dimmon that was producing any quality things. Mm -hmm. Other of Firestone to an extent as well. Yep. Um, but I think his course was, uh, he had a very good course at the time. So, good. so, but those were the only two players, you know? So I was like, okay, cool. And then I already had some YouTube experience. So I was like, let me just make tutorials ranking for Klaviyo. And now we're like the only Klaviyo channel. It recently went public. Did you buy a song? I did not. Did you consider? I didn't even know they were. <laughs> okay. I'm not an investor, guys. No, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not an investor yet. But no, just have an idea public. So I know I know that market cap was nine the valuation was nine point yep. five yep. billion. Yep. Um I think maybe it's gonna do some really sick things in the future. I would just rather invest in Trump. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shopify owns I think ten percent. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you get exposure to Flavio anyways. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I was looking at their yeah, prospectus. It's like six hundred mil, I think, in AR. So six hundred is probably what more, more than ten X on for basically. Yeah, but, but they have really strong retention though. Because yeah. for their business model to collapse, it would either like you want to sell that merchants at the same time. Yeah, like OmniSend would need to take them over, which I doubt. Yeah. Um or like Shopify would essentially, as a business model, need to collapse, right? Which I don't think they're going to collapse, but I do think in the next couple of years, D 2 C is going to be quite rough because people's pockets are going to tighten. Mm. You know, I've already noticed that, bro. Because like, I, I have quite a lot of friends in the call space, and selling like higher ticket programs is much harder today than it is like in twenty twenty when they were just printing cash, and giving like stimmies and shit. Yeah, so back to your clients sort or of thing. So after you pivoted. From yeah. Facebook to the email side, right? Um, how how did you learn the skill? Obviously, like true experience on yourself. Mm -hmm. And like, when did you start hiring and stuff? Um, so I, I always had team members because you know, like I had a Facebook agency. So the Facebook agency had some team members which I was able to pivot across. Like my designer, uh, my designer, we've been working with for like three and a half years, like nice. since the beginning. Where did you hire from? Awkward. Oh, oh you was one which which company? Oh, Serbia. Oh, Serbia. Nice. Yeah, yeah, like, it's crazy because yeah. you can tell it's been a few years because um, he, he's like got married and had a kid and it's like, bro, like, it's wow. crazy. And then I moved countries, moved cities, you know, so, um, yeah, so I, I had team members since the beginning of the email agency, but like, I was doing a lot of the, I was doing all of the strategy and uh, majority of the execution by myself mm -hmm. for the first year or so. And then, um, 20 so all the design did yourself? No, no. I'm I'm a useless designer. Okay. Yeah. It's just all the automation and sort of strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like if if I did the designs, I would look like a monkey crew. <laughs> it's fun. Um. So everything I did myself except the design for about a year, and then 2022 was largely the same. We had a couple more team members come on, but the thing that was going to change the game for me was actually hiring like a COO and getting proper team structures in place. Um. Because. Without, because agency is where repackaging human resources to sell our profit by adding value to like our team members time, right? Yep. And without like a proper team, uh, team structure in place, you just can't scale labor. So 
Oh, that's actually one other thing. So slight side tangent. Of all of the brands I've noticed go from like seven figures to eight figures. Yeah. Um, if they are running like a portfolio of brands doing about the same, they always have a really strong team structure in terms of like, uh, they, they have like a person in charge of this specific brand mm. or like in charge of media buying across the board or something along those lines alongside the CEO. So the you mean a, a head of a function. So what specific function you have one head and yes. across the CEO? Yes, okay. not even one function, but it, let's say you're in a portfolio of brands, right? You have like one uh, CEO, uh, I guess like CEO of this specific brand, CEO of this specific brand. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was hiring a COO and then that's why how we were able to grow from like last December, we were like four people, including me. Now we're like uh, 16 full time, including myself, with one more coming on in general. It's just about having that dialed in team structure. What well, what does a CEO actually do? Because they don't do execution, right? They don't they don't do actual campaigns. So what are they? So how I how I did it, I can't speak to what the formal process should be, but how I did it was basically my CEO started off as a strategist for me, right? Oh, so now like, like doing the campaigns. Yeah, yeah. So he was doing the campaigns, all of this stuff, and then I kind of like I was like, listen, Adam, you I need you to step up into this role um here's all the perks that comes with it and basically i just spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one, many many hours like translating like my skill in management communication uh everything that i've accumulated over the years to him and then i i mapped out like this org chart mm. which org chart is just a fun way of saying like hierarchy right yeah. like you know clients strategists me whatever so he started off by being a blend of a, a strategist and a CEO at the same time, but then as the team leveled up, now he doesn't really have his, any of his own clients. Nice. So, you so know, it, it just talks to the team basically. Yeah, yeah. So he he's transitioned into this his new layer of management, mm -hmm. right? Because as you uh, as the organization gets bigger, you can't have too many points of contact. If you do, then um, you yeah, yeah, they just get up, you know, because you can only manage like five people at once. Any more, it's just cool. so he ascended to this new layer of management, and then that was me. So now I do the sales, he manages the team, and it works really well. Like, the service delivery is sick because we have great retention. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I can focus all of my time producing content to Sorry. educate and then. How does, because you said one person can probably only manage five people at a time. Right. If you have 30 clients on yeah. the roster, is he talking to, because each team probably can take four to five, maybe? Yes. Right? Yeah. So he's talking to five uh, teams. Is that correct? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. But when when I say team, the strategist manages the designers under that. So they work with uh, the designers. Okay. So there's just, him strategists, right? So that way it's like much more linear. So okay. he has less points of contact. I just have him as a point of contact and then I oversee like mm -hmm. the team once a week, just make sure like- Like a one-on-one -on -one basis, okay. No, I don't do one-on-one basis. It's in one, one to team. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. one, one to team once a week so that I, I get a pulse of what's going on as well as I get the updates from him and then mm -hmm. it's fine. Okay. What? Have you seen such a, like a team, what is the maximum capacity that they can take on? Because after a while, we'll, we'll, yeah. you know. Yeah. You, you know what it is? It's like three to six, bro. Three, yeah. three to six, maybe seven. Because some clients um, are just easier to handle than others, honestly. Because like some want a lot more revisions. Um, some plan things uh, like super last minute. Mm -hmm. So we just want to make sure we're stepping up to adapt to that. Because ultimately it's like, um, we're, we're here to fulfill a role for them. We're here to get them results and whatever it takes, you know? Yeah. So it's not like this team has, every team has four, five clients. It's, this team might have three, this team might have six, seven, but generally speaking, it's between that four to six range. How do you, can you say, if I promote you from a campaign, campaign strategist to CEO, yeah. someone needs, they need to be, be incentivized correctly, right? Yeah. What are those folks? Oh, you give him a profit share. That's it. Okay. Yeah, he gets profit share in the agency. 
is uh, based in. He lives in Malaysia, but he's uh, he's Malaysian, but he uh, studied in New York. So he's like nice mix. Wait, I thought you said he's from Serbia. No, that's my designer. Oh, okay, designer from okay. Serbia. So right now, 14 to 16 people full time, something like that. How how do you spend your time? I mean, it's creating content, selling and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. But if you get sick and you don't sell, is there a salesperson? No. It's for me. It's it's founder led sales, bro. I, I think having founder led sales is really important, especially if um, because I have a really good knowledge of how to grow an e commerce, mm -hmm. and it's hard to replace that. And my style of selling is consultative, so we would hop on a call. A lot of the time, because they come, the leads come. So we only have two channels of acquisition. Yeah. YouTube inbound, referrals, that's it. So referrals, obviously they trust us because there's, there's already an established connection. If it's from YouTube, they trust me because they've, like, I have over a hundred tutorials teaching this shit. Like not just Flavio anymore, because earlier this year I branched out into general econ about like unit economics, how to build customer service teams, blah, blah. So there's a high degree of trust there. So on the calls, a lot of the time, it's just like talking about their brands overall and what like, their scaling bottlenecks are. Um, and then they already trust me to do their emails, so yeah. it's like a really straightforward thing. Yeah. But they know you're also not the one doing the execution. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Um, and, but like a lot of, like sometimes the last time I ran an agency, the expectation is always, I came in through your funnel, right? I came in through your content. Yeah. And so I expect you to. Hey, I have that as a limiting belief as well. Yeah. But you know what it is? It's about the handover process between you and the client during the sales cycle to you and your team. Mm. So for example, um, I'm very hands off with it now in the sense of like, let's say you just uh, signed as a client, I would say, hey, um, John, I'm going to introduce you to Adam, my COO, and then also he's going to be adding the rest of the team. This is the expectation, like we're going to get the first campaign out for you in the next like 72 hours for 48 to 72 if it's like a weekend or something, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so and so is going to drop you the updates along with the sample designs. You can give feedback or make modifications. And, and yeah, it's like that, that handover process is very close. As soon as they jump in the Slack channel, the team introduces themselves ASAP, like ideally with generally within like the first 10, 20 minutes. Yep. Um, sometimes quicker, sometimes a bit longer if it's a Sunday. And then because that touch point is established, it makes it much easier to like peel them away. And then one thing I have with my team is, it's like, we all have slacks on our phones. So if a client messages, yeah. we respond right away. It's not like you can't wait 12 hours. It's not like, you know, it's, it's, it just, I need, I need time now, you know? So, Whenever a client messages in the channel, initially they may tag me, but my team responds in like three minutes, five minutes, whatever. Mm -hmm. So over time, it trains the behavior of just, yeah, like, control yeah. this fast. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's move from the agency side sure. to talk about you moved to Dubai. Oh, yeah. So what, okay. <laughs> what, what happened there and what was the, the motivation or like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I moved to Dubai July 14th this year. 2023. Yeah. Okay. So started online business four years in. And yeah. Like, I need to get all this. Yeah. So I started in 2020, January, and then three and a half years later, I was like, it's time to make the Dubai move. Um, obviously, tax is a big factor in it. Yeah. No shit. No, absolutely not. I'm proud. Because yeah. I don't want to find some <laughs> Like, everything that the UK government spends money on, I basically disagree with. So. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, so, um, made the Dubai move, but the factors were not just tax, because I heard, I can't remember exactly who said this. It might have been Alex mm -hmm. but it might have been someone else. But it was bas basically like, you know, why move to a tax haven if you genuinely don't enjoy living there as much? Right? Because, yeah. What's the point? Yeah, the quality of life. Yeah, like you, than, yeah. Yeah, like you we started our businesses to have more freedom in our life and choices and blah blah. So why go to a place that you enjoy less just for more money? So 
I visited Dubai three times, one 2022 April for a couple of weeks. And then last year I came here for Formula One in November. And then this year, April, I spent the whole month here. Just with recce and see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, uh, do a little bit of recon and also like make some friends, honestly. Because <laughs> I think like, it's not really about where you live. It's just about who you get to be around, right? So uh, made a few friends and I, I realized like the thing I liked about Dubai is I can learn from it. It's every every dinner I join, absolutely humbled. Mm. Like, I'm like wow, these people are so interesting. And I'm like, wow, this is big city shit. And and obviously, you know, like in networking scenarios, you don't show it. But like in my heart, I must have just said that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like it it was really the network that was a big factor, and then also like the convenience. London, but London's okay. Uh, yeah, but imagine. So this morning, right? My apartment looks clean. Clean as came. Oh, okay, okay. Clean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Clean as uh, came. 9 a.m. They come twice a week. I, I can order them from an app, right? Mm. Any food I want. There's so many restaurants to order from. It's not like in uh, uh, Manchester, which uh, the place I was living in previously for a year and a half. It's like very limited choices, right? Yeah. Here, you can have this. You know, I'm five minutes drive right from the beach. Um, five minutes to Dubai Mall. It's just nice, bro. And the apartments here are so much bigger. Like this apartment in London would probably cost like three mil, three mil probably. Central London, yeah, like one one to one and a half mil. Yeah. But this is is much cheaper. Um, and then also Dubai, yes, it's like more expensive to live in, but like it's basically free because of how much tax I get to save. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So have you uh? Do you you have a do you have a UK entity or is it just killed by like no so so there's a US entity now uh, that I run like billing through uh, is it because of uh, US science or like why no US Stripe because the problem with the uh, Dubai Stripe is your payment decline rates is very high same with UK like even when I was in the UK I would invoice if you looked at my failed payments. It's so high. It affects core sales, it affects clients, because mm-hmm. I have to chase more billing, uh, payments. Um, yeah. Wait, it only affects the UK. Pay. I thought the UK would be probably easier. No. From... It, for US, because it's like still uh, one country to another. Mm. US Stripe to US Stripe is green black. But even with payment history, good payment histories and stuff, cards still get declined. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you suck on the, the Forex, you know? Yes, exactly. So uh, everything gets converted to GBP. Okay, so I suffer on the Forex, and then Dubai is worse, because Dubai, like US doesn't like Dubai, yeah, you know, yeah. like I've tried to have US wire payments go from a US bank account to Dubai, mm-hmm. like some of my clients tried to pay me wire, they're like you're funding ISIS, like <laughs> lock it off, you know, return to center type of vibe, yeah. so yeah. Okay, wait, so how do you get a bank account? Yeah. It's just a pure bank account, like, not a like checking savings, like how does... Uh, here's a... I believe it's a checking account I have. So I have a business account, I have a plus. That's it. Okay. And then you just need your Emirates ID and then you need your company. Okay. How do you stay here? What, are you, is it a tourist visa? Like how does no, no, no. I, so basically, like, I, I'm i employed by my company as a general manager. Mm-hmm. So on paper, I'm a general manager. Yeah. yeah. And then I get paid salary, which I decide. But does the US entity employ for you? No, no, no. So I'm like, uh, I don't know the specifics of it, but long story. I guess my question is, how does the uh, UAE government recognize you as legal? What's it? Oh, because I'm employed by my Dubai company. Okay, so, which as a Dubai company as well. Yeah, so okay. which owns the US company. Which owns the US company. Okay. And there's no need for you to, must you move the, the payments from the US company to the Dubai? To say that, oh, like, the yeah. legitimate business going on here. Yeah. Okay. I think that's how it works. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not, not, not financial advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll lastly talk about e-commerce execution kind of things, right? Um, is there a specific niche, particular niche that you generally work with and that, like, you, you do great results for or prefer? Um, you talked about supplements just now as well. I, I know a couple of supplement guys in Singapore as well. They do, like, crazy numbers. Um, yeah, tell us more about that, sir. 
we, I don't have like a specific niche that I'm really good at. Yeah. But I can tell you, I one weird thing is I know like way too fucking much about like women's shampoo and women's hair. <laughs> okay, that I know yeah. way way too much about. Um, but that's just because we had a client that was like uh, very educational for us, basically. Yeah, and we work without we are working with uh, for like just over two years now. Mm. Um, so I know like a lot of weight around yeah. women's hair products. Okay. Not as I and obviously I'm I'm a very good marketer for that as well. But um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> funny thing to know about, right? Yeah. So everything's been B two C so far. There's not like B two B brand who's approach you because, like to me, like on the B two B side, the AOBs and LTBs are like crazy, right? So like they could definitely need email, and yeah, sorry, but the retainer you can charge it's like could be insane. <laughs> but that's like, hold out though, right? No, so like B two B companies like wholesale orders. Still, no, still do lead gen. Okay. Uh, they do. They close by sales, but they still need. They still have like a database. They could use like a yeah. Marketo or Clavio or whatever it is, but mm-hmm. they still have a database that they need to sell to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the problem with doing B two B wholesale orders is a lot of the call to actions are not to a product page. It's to book a call, call this number, or like register your interest. Yeah. So. We're only in charge of a very small segment of that funnel, whereas with email marketing for D2C products, we can be in charge of the whole funnel. And you can show the value much better. Yes, exactly. Okay. We, we are branching out into other niches, though. So one of my new videos is how to work with Stripe businesses, because there's a direct integration between Stripe and Flavia, so you can mm-hmm. track attribution. Mm-hmm. So okay. uh, we're expanding into uh, adjacent platforms. That's it. Okay, got it. Uh, what are like, the challenges that you see from the, if they clear 3, 4 mil per year versus a 12, 15 mil that you said just now? Um, like, like what, what is the client experiencing? Oh, okay. And also, yeah. like, how, how do you not need value add to them such that they can overcome these challenges? Sure. So in terms of scaling bottlenecks, a lot of the time, the difference I've seen between brands are doing 3, 4 mil a year to like 10 to 15 is, um, the size of their market matters to mm-hmm. an extent. Okay. Obviously, you know, most markets can facilitate 15 mil, but in one market, it might be easier to facilitate that compared to another market because your marketing message, like the degree in which it needs to be dialed in is much higher. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the time, honestly, I think it comes down to like team structure because at three, four mil a year, it comes down to either the CEO needing, needing to fight comfort mentally. Like three to four mil a year, you're making good money, you know, like 20% margins. Ah, okay. 600K, 700K, like fighting the comfort of just being okay. That's that is what, to, yeah, yeah, and wanting to expand. Okay. If the CEO is like successful with that, then it's about like a um, couple ways, really. I mean, normally you can scale to like, uh, one, two million a month with just single products, it literally just depends on how much product market fit you have. Right? Mm-hmm. So we've had clients scale the most simple products to a mill a month in the first 30 days. And it's literally just because the market shine. Yeah. Right. But then to get that to get it consistent to that 10 to 15 mil, you you really need to have a good product. Because you you can saturate your market so quickly if your product sucks. Because um, I can't reveal the product of this client, but I'll say it appeals to this like uh, niche fan base, right? It, let's pretend it's like video games, for example, right? You play video games, you buy from this client. Guess what? You have gamer friends, right? So you just bought this product that you're all excited about. You buy it and it comes and it's it doesn't align with expectations. You're gonna tell all of your other gamer friends shit. <laughs> so it spreads like network. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think the thing that kills most brands is are actually the intangibles, the shit that doesn't come up on Facebook dashboard. It doesn't come up in um, your Facebook engagement score or like your, your Google Ad CPC, whatever. Yeah. Right? It's the intangibles like. Because you cannot measure John telling Boyan about how shit this product is. Because guess what? If like if you're selling to you as a demographic, yep. you're friends with the same demographic. 
you know? So shit like that, or like um, Facebook ad comment sentiment, a lot of it is just basically a, a complicated way of saying a lot of that. Yeah. Right? So try to fight that, super difficult. Okay. So you have to nail product quality, nail fulfillment times, customer service. If you can nail those things and have the product market fit, yeah. it's not hard. Okay, so what I'm not understanding is that excluding dropshippers, right? Because I'm guessing you're meeting with brands. Why would we have dropshippers? Like five brands. Okay. Yeah. Why why would um product quality be an issue at that stage? Um you'll be surprised, bro, because so a lot of the dropshippers that we work with, right? I mean they, they could start with dropshipping as a fulfillment model mm. and then transition into a brand. That's where that danger lies, since it's that awkward oh, stage of like Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, I just made my inventory. Yeah, like 150k net this one. Do I invest in product quality? And then also because it's, again, it's the intangibles, right? Mm. Like on paper, this product is scaling to the moon right now. Mm. So, so fuck it. Why? Because you, then you start. Why, why not about my catch list? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, yeah. Then you don't think necessarily about product quality, right? Okay. Um, Because you're so focused on the numbers. Because the numbers make sense. So I can scale ads, so I can do this, I can do that, I can do this, and suddenly, like, oh shit, the brand's not profitable. Okay. They scale too hard, too bad, negative like, sentiments, yeah. right? Yeah. You basically yeah. add yourself. Yeah, and then, like, the for, so that, that's if you're using dropshipping as a fulfillment method, doing, like, I'm talking, like, private, like, custom packaging dropshipping, not, like, you know, I don't know, like, AliExpress or CJ dropshipping yeah. straight to the customer. Yeah. Um, but then there's the other side of if you're a brand going from three mil, three four mil a year to uh, fifteen, let's say, yeah, obviously there's a fighting comfort element, but also your product quality is probably decent. The main thing is, I think a lot of founders get like shiny object syndrome because they hit the scaling plateau, yeah. and then rather than trying to you know refine their current winning product to fit a wider demographic, mm -hmm. they just think, ah. Oh, if I just launch a complimentary product, ah, okay. I could, uh, you know, I could, in yeah. theory, double my revenue. Yeah, the upsell fallacy, basically. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they go into different verticals and start trying to scale horizontally when a lot of the time it's the wrong move. Because on paper, this product, let's say you're selling, if you're in the pet niche, right? You sell, uh, ah, you sell this dog chew toy, which goes viral for some weird reason. <laughs> and then you're like, ah, Right idea, let me sell the food that goes in the toy, don't you, right? <laughs> and then it's like, and then that product takes, I don't know, three months to um, develop and then one month for the samples to arrive into your warehouse and then you you should have better with it, you know? Because how the fuck do you run marketing angles around this dog food that everyone can buy from supermarkets, ultimately, right? Okay. So. I think a lot of founders, they, maybe uh, they develop products with like, oh, this is complementary to my existing winning products, so therefore it has product market fit. Not understanding the... They don't, not, they, they don't want the secondary product, basically. Yes, they, 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 um, they don't think about how am I going to market this to a top of funnel audience? Because that's what's really going to drive like that growth, right? Yep. You need to be reaching new top of funnel audiences. Yep. So this product, yes, is complementary to the first, but is it a top of funnel product? If it's not, then fuck it, you know? Mm -hmm. So expanding product base is huge. And then also doing things like cash flow management is, is big problems, right? So making sure you have uh, like good payment terms with your manufacturers, um, seeing where you can cut, like drop cost of goods sold with the volume, um, having good credit with like, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, like Stripe, Stripe being shut down is a huge problem if you scale too fast in like brand new dropshipping, for example. example. Um, payment processing with like Plana and stuff. There's a lot of like things that you got to get dialed in and like infrastructure that you got to build before you can just take the brand to like 10 to 50. Uh, sharing something on personal experience. So like, like you said, for example, like take a product from zero to a mil a month, for example, in 30 days. I've done something similar. My uh, my suspicion, like my what I think is that a lot of brand owners they never get to eight figures. They never get to like eight hundred k per month uh, because they don't focus on the front end, and they, they do all the stuff on, on the back end, like CRO optimization, whatever it is. That's like 
just get front end profitable on a profitable ROAS and just scale the budget. And like, that's how we get to eight figures, but yes. Would you would you agree with me? And like No, hundred percent. Oh. But I guess maybe our approach is slightly different because I work on the back end. Yes. You work on the front end. Yeah. So I would actually love to hear your theory on this. Cause I think a lot of brand owners, like active brand owners, not branded dropshippers, mm. brand owners, they're too in love with their products to the point where because you you obsess over your thing, you believe that you can make it work. But if you just look at the raw unit economics of your products, it makes no fucking sense. You have a fifty dollar average order value, right? And thirty five goes on top of goods sold. Yep. Good luck, buddy. Good luck trying to sell. You know, like yeah, yeah. fuck you up from me. You just you just cannot do it. So so I think like. Unit economics optimization falls on the back end, mm -hmm. but that drives the top of fun. Because if you suddenly go from 35 cogs with 50 AOV down to 10 cogs, now you have $40 ad budget to essentially play with on the gross margin. Yeah. Which a lot healthy. Got it. For the bigger brands that you work with, right? Um, obviously, to grow the list, extremely important for you yeah. back end. Uh, to grow the list, you need marketing mix, you need like tons of traffic coming in. Yeah. I'm pretty sure like pay traffic is great, like you can scale but you're like amplifying what amplifying what you're already doing, right? Yes. How is the mix in terms of the top of funnel traffic? Where is it coming from uh, besides pay traffic? Um it depends on the brand. We we have like brands that were exclusively organic. Mm -hmm. Um organic is a really strong channel. We just see it how organic meaning SEO or like organic social. Both, both. Um, some brands are SEO focused. Like we have this one brand that we're uh, we just uh, we're working with. They they're primarily SEO focused because they have a sick domain name that's been around for like <laughs> twenty years, yeah. thirty years, something like that. Um, so SEO does really well for them. They spend like a thousand dollars a month on Google Ads. Uh, and then I'm just like, how the fuck are you collecting like one eighty backend a month? And I'm like crazy 180,000 on thousand dollar ads and they don't run for Facebook mm -hmm. not even retail, I don't think um just that you sorry niche like is it like the boring like car tires <laughs> they kind of um it's not car tires but it's in like it's it's a boring, it's niche boring. okay yeah got it, got it. um so so yeah man there's there's a lot of ways to uh, organic traffic again varies like YouTube organic traffic has higher conversion rates compared to TikTok organic traffic, for example. TikTok oh, organic traffic is ass, dude. Like, is it? <laughs> well, as in, as in, the intent is not as high. Okay. So, so when you're doing CRO on a organic TikTok organic exclusive store, yeah, you know, conversion rates are going to be much lower. Okay. You might have really high ads to carts, but low initiated checkouts, and it, and it has to do with the traffic intent, mm. right? Yeah. So. Uh, judging that is quite hard if you're like multi multi channel with no consistency. So then CRO kind of becomes a little bit impossible as well. Have you worked with any brand that is like predominantly PR? Like, no. Yes. No. no, I'm actually so curious about that because one of my uh, friends, he runs a uh, multi seven figure brand out in Hong Kong. Mm. And he was like, yeah, like, uh, I don't know if I can say the name of the brand, but basically this this brand that sells travel stuff. Mm. Uh, they do about 100 million a year. Sorry, they travel have, meaning? Like, like travel accessories. Okay. Um, they do about 100 million a year, and they're basically exclusively PR. And the same with, actually, I can't say about this brand. You know Caseify? Yeah. Caseify is basically exclusively PR. Yeah, the guy was the Hong Kong founder. You know, kids in Kenya. Yeah, they sell Hong Kong the uh, factory in Shenzhen. Yeah. They sell cases, iPhone cases, at a stupidly expensive price for no reason. Three hundred million. Oh, three hundred million. Yes. And how they grow? Apparently, it's just like PR articles around collaborations they have with brands, other yeah. brands. Yeah, and it's like the influencers. And so. Yeah, and it blows my mind because I'm like, I don't care if I'm making like. Two, three, four, five, ten mil a year. I'm never spending eighty dollars on a fucking case in like a dragon ball. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll just buy it from AliExpress because I really want one. You know, they're basically like a, if Davy, Bugatti, yeah, <laughs> like insane connections. It's basically what they're doing, just at scale. With oh, fair, fair. yeah. But Davy's getting up there though. Like I, I know he's doing a bunch of collaborations with like the cartoon characters. Yeah, yeah. 
they shouldn't, maybe, not sure that I should talk about this, but, like, personally, I feel baby is restricted because, uh, what are you wearing on kid? It's like this. But sleepwear is just like this. It's just like, he guys got to transition from a hoodie to a sleepwear because people in the temperate countries can buy the hoodies, right? But then you're just dead. But, but that has a, Udi has, again, has a viral marketing angle component to it. Yes. Right? They go into sleepwear, they're generic again. They're, com- they're competing on a commoditized market. Yeah. Um, That's why I think it, like, it makes struggle, like, it's at 200 mil, right? But how, you, yeah. how do you get to it? 500? Basically. I don't know. And I don't know. I, I think it's just like taking yeah. it global because Australia is also capped. Yeah. Yeah. Australia has a really small population. If, if you're a brand owner that's doing like 50 mil a year in Australia alone, if you take it to the U.S. successfully, mm-hmm. you turn it to the business. I have a friend who does like mosquito in Australia. They, they sell mosquitoes or they sorry, sell sorry, sorry. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> like you guys get like a pocket of malaria, like <laughs> you open it and it's like everyone is mosquito. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, mosquito uh, repellents. Not the repellent. Killers. Yes. Killing things. Basically, the not recurring. They put the lamp on. And yeah. Just kill mosquitoes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He does like two mil a month. In Australia alone. Sure. Yeah. But to be fair, like you buy up the entire market basically. Well, yeah. 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 But then also you could that would pop on Amazon. Yeah. It's extremely commoditized basically. Of course. Yeah. So you're competing, but then you're competing on volume, so you get the best like. So you have a good um, what's it called a uh, a good defensible business in that case, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. But back to the. Three to four mil to, to ten mil, yeah, that's not a thing. Any advice for those brand owners? Um, besides being not motivated on the founder side, yeah. um, any advice for them on scaling? That, that's yeah. not only the like, email mm-hmm. side, and maybe also finance. Yeah. Email side, honestly, it's we ramp up the volume a little bit. We can do a bit more segmentation, but emails, it's like once you know what you're doing, it's largely the same. We would build out like post purchase journeys a lot more intricately for them, for example. Yeah. Mm. Uh, on the ad side, I think you could probably speak more to it, but because I'm like three years out of the game, so I, well, we're inside the to add to and chatting shit, basically, right? Um, but I do think like dialing in unit economics is really important and just understanding like how big is your active market supposed to be. Because, you know, if you're trying to sell mosquito nets in like Dubai, there's not much many mosquitoes, so you can't scale to that two mil a year. So, so it's like understanding the audience, the needs of the audience, and then just your product as well. Okay. I have a very, very specific email question because I did email before. Um, after you automate the flows, like your manual broadcast emails, right? Mm-hmm. How do you maintain consistency and uh, cadence of sending out, sending out those emails without the message of the email being like stale? So like, you, know, you could always be saying, Okay, we are live. Uh, yeah, yeah. Get the sale, and then also sometimes it's education. Yeah, uh, like you know the, the, the shampoo thing, right? Can you talk about shampoo itself? But after those two two things, how else do you maintain the freshness for the others? And, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, uh, the the answer is you will end up repeating content regardless. You know, and it's like most brands they have enough things to talk about uh, over let's say a one year horizon, right? And guess what, people are. Just the game. Just hit frequency and then yeah. bro, even yeah. with my YouTube, yeah, I used to think, oh, I already made this tutorial in the past. Yeah. No, like, beginner's guide, 2024, <laughs> play here, beginner's guide, for beginners, A to Z setup. I make that shit every year. Oh, that okay. is basically the same video. There's going to be minor tweaks, because obviously, like, for example, in 2024, uh, Gmail and Yahoo, they're going to have more deliverability requirements. So, yeah, like, the tutorials change, but it's like, it's just same dish. This time it's right. <laughs> yeah, Last yeah. time it's like to be, you know. Got so, it. Got it. so yeah, I, I think it's just you know repackaging a little bit, but also realizing that you know the people reading your emails. Number one, they may not read the whole email. Mm. Number two, they may not have opened that angle last time. Number three, um, they probably forgot. Exactly. Even if they read it in detail. And number four, a lot of the time, you know, with marketing, it's just you need to remind people because you're in a noisy marketplace, right? If you look at like retargeting ads, the frequency is never like less, it's never just one, yeah. you know, it's always two, 
more Sexy. yeah exactly so people need multiple reminders because they don't listen on that first touch point. so you know you could say oh my shampoo will make your hair grow back five inches a day yeah in seven days but that even if it's a subject line they might be in an area where there's no or like you embed that somewhere in your content, but they just don't read it. Or they mm-hmm. read it and they're like, oh yeah, you know what? I, I need that at some point. Two weeks later, boom, again, 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 again. And that's how you train behavior, right? Through repetition. Okay. So, yeah. How much frequency, how, much, how often do you send? Depends on the brand. Depends on the size of the brand, actually, and also the time period. So it's, the range is like two to five. But five being like, very big Black Friday, big, big brand. Um, generally, I think brands either lean into the extreme of severely undersending or severely oversending. Okay. Um, but a good cadence for a majority of brands is like two to three a week. Two to four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Have you ever, um, brands that do a sell to the EU, GDPR big thing, uh, DOI, you know, DOI, I'm sure, double opt in? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's like a big. We don't do double opt-in. Oh, you don't? No. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> it's, so I had. So we've never had an issue. It, yeah, but is it because the brand is not big enough to get audited, or like what? Perhaps. Okay. But I don't know because I've never done double opt-in in the EU. I don't think it's that strict of a requirement, mm-hmm. you know. Um. But yeah, like. Because the problem with double opt-in is, if you do double opt-in, you slash your email capture rate by half. Yep. Yep. Like, literally, you capture 100% less. Yep. So, oh, oh. <laughs> Okay. I guess when you professionalize, like, the business really becomes uh, much bigger than the right regulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's like if, you, if you're, like, formalizing everything for, like, a public listing or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a big compliance issue for really large corporations, but I think for small companies, they don't really give a shit. Yeah. Um, we've never been flagged for it. Been no issues. Yeah. Last question for me. Oh, um, we do abide by GDPR in terms of opt-in. Why abide by GDPR? Yes. <laughs> it's something like the yeah, European like, Union is like, yeah, 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 just that when you were saying, like, hey, we don't really care about that. It. It's like, yeah, nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, GDPR, like, what's that? Uh, the Torah agency advice by GDPR. Yeah, fully compliant. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, sorry, last question. On the email side, right? I see beautiful graphics all the time, right, from the email agencies and stuff. Uh, but then it, when you populate an email with such stuff, too much <laughs> multimedia, mm-hmm. delivered, delivered uh, rates are affected as well as the loading speed, etc. Uh, mm. Thoughts on that and any advice? Mm. Don't use too many GIFs. I think uh, like one mistake I've seen is brands use GIFs in every email, makes it a lot heavier. Uh, but also I think if you do like good amount of segmentation as well as like list hygiene, mm-hmm. you're not really going to have that much of a problem. And then also with um, uploading the images, just make sure you use a lossy compression algorithm. Yeah. Stuff like that. It, it shrinks the image. For example, I, uh, a couple of years ago, we did we uploaded it in PNGs. Yeah, very big process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lossless compression is terrible. So now we do JPEGs if we need to upload images. Um, but yeah, it's it's not like a huge issue. We have the, I mean, it's kind of like trading off if you were to build it natively in Clavio between aesthetics and um, the size of the email. If you want beautiful looking email, you can't, you can't really custom code it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And if you do, it's just too labor intensive. And, you know, for a brand that's doing one to, let's say, six mil a year. It doesn't make sense for them to be paying us um, premium for like more developers and stuff if we can get very slow results. So what you're building it in Big Mumpus and then you're just doing it in Clavio Office. Yeah. I've had people give me shit for it, but like we get good results. So like hey, we're hey, we're to see for itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like because yeah. you know how like I I put made a post about this on I did a couple of YouTube about uh 
email the sites, right? On Canva and shit. And the combo was a beginner tutorial. It wasn't like what we'd actually produce, right? Hey, this game. Yeah, yeah. Hey, and like, oh, actually, you know, when you're exporting a JPEG, like, oh, like the files are like, too big and it's gonna affect it. I was like, this video was made for brands doing sub 50k a month. Like, the fuck do they care about like file size? They should be, as you said, like focused on driving top of file. Right? And then on LinkedIn, you know, like LinkedIn, people like love their comments. Yeah, like they love to comment on like their expertise and coming across as the expert. It's like, yeah, obviously, like it's going to impact the deliverability, but what's the alternative? Like, you, you want me to custom code everything for like, it's not it big makes big no big sense, big. you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we're coming to the end of the interview. Uh, Boyan, would you like to? Tell people how to get in contact with you. Uh, sure. If you want to engage your agency or email or consulting or whatever it is. Please. Yeah, sure. So, so my YouTube channel is just my name, Boyanzao, and then my Instagram is real Boyanzao. And uh, we're actually really good at emails, so you should check out my YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, we'll link. We'll link below. Yeah, like if you like my videos, then consider booking in a call because we're gonna code your emails for you. Thank you, Boyan, for your time. See you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See you soon. Bye-bye.